Well, thank you all for coming to my presentation on real-time phase detection and emotion gender classification using convolutional neural networks. Um, first, a little bit about me, um, Octavio. It's a, I am, a, yes, as he mentioned, a master's student here and a well uh, participant of the Robocop uh, athlete competition. So all of this work came um, or was brought up to because of the Robocop, international Robocop competition for the at-home at league. So, yes, well, our main motivation, what would we, why would we like to have uh, an emotion and gender classification system? Well, uh, here in our university, we have this robotic uh, curse, and obviously our intentions are to put this into a robot. And, well, domestic and our current robot platforms um, are currently being used for home systems or as personal intelligence systems. So in this case, we have the robot here, Pepper, which is very famous. And I believe this uh, robot here belongs to a French company as well that they're trying to sell it so they can deploy it at your home and they can be, yeah, serve as intelligence system that can be take pictures and remind you of things and um, yes. Uh, obviously, these sort of robots require a high level perception skills. And in this case, um, we can think of it uh, we can think of several examples. One of them is a person that is uh, an elderly woman or man that is just uh, trying to communicate that the person is in pain or that the person might have some sort of um, some sort of anger or might be sad and maybe it's unable to express it. So a person might be in pain that is unable to express it or therefore the robot might, uh, would, we would like that the robot extracts information from this person's face and in order to proceed as it should proceed. For example, in order to call someone or in order to tell someone. And yeah, there are also other cases in more going to the other extreme in which the robot would like to take a picture and there we would only like to take a picture when the, everyone in the frame is happy, right? So I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, cases in which we can think in which we would like to extract information from the user's face in order to convey some sort of uh, movement with the robot. And well, one important characteristic of uh, emotion classification is that it's not so easy. <laughs> one would think that um, maybe classifying someone's else, um, someone else's emotion only by looking at the face could uh, be potentially or substantially easy, but apparently humans perform around 65% uh, accuracy on, the, on this current data set that we're using, and which is the third 2013 data set. And yeah, it's open source and everything, and it has 35,000 grayscale images. So in this example, I have shuffled all these images, and then we could look around and see, um, yeah, I don't know, like it's easy for us to detect this person that it's happy, right? But maybe this one, yeah, I don't know, I don't know which class should I assign to this person. Maybe sad or neutral, and also, I mean, the baby, like, I don't know which class to give to the baby, right? Which level to give to it. And yeah, another thing that we could see from the data set here, is that the faces are not presented in a canonical way. That means that the, the pose of the face is uh, rotated, so this might also be problematic eventually for performing a classification. And yeah, the other data set that we use was the IMDB data set, which consists of images uh, from the IMDB website. It's around almost half a million uh, pictures. And as you can see, there are um, yeah, it's pictures of the, uh, the small world Hollywood uh, ecosystem, right? And this eventually leads to problems, as we, I will um, talk about later. But yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the biggest data sets out there, which has around half a million images of genders, or sex. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, in spite of the problematic, uh, problematic uh, things that we might able to have in a robot, which would uh, be basically that we are constrained hardware-wise, and also that the estimation or the classification of gender might be and emotions are rather complicated, we have to create a system that is able to be efficient and that is able to perform all of these tasks. So in this work, um, we present such system that is able to do phase detection, gender classification, emotion classification, all in real time and open source. Or we release our, our models and our all code open source. So it's able to also um, it's robot or, or framework independent. So we also try to make the community in, or the robot community try to adapt our software. So we try to make all the appropriate software accommodations to 
So this can be implemented as well. And furthermore, we also know that convolutional neural networks or neural networks in general are used as black boxes. And I mean, there are black boxes, but often we would like to see what are the hidden uh, features learned by the convolutional neural network. Therefore, we also implemented a, a visualization method, which I'm not saying it will tell you what actually it, uh, the convolutional neural network learned, but it tells you something. Uh, it makes a visualization that is, uh, I believe, interesting to interpret. And this, call is, uh, this visualization is called guided backpropagation. And, yeah. So I don't know how you guys are familiar with uh, neural networks. Uh, I, I worked uh, for around one year, but uh, I don't know. Could you guys raise your hand if you have worked with neural networks before? So I just can get a feeling. Yeah, OK, so there's uh, a lot of people here. So I will go uh, quickly about it, but not, not, not too fast. <laughs> so basically, uh, neural networks are functions approximators. So you have some inputs and you have some outputs. And you want to create a function that maps these inputs to these outputs. And how you want to create this function, it's uh, by a set of models in which the model contains uh, weights, which are represented by these arrows. And we are changing these arrows using an optimization algorithm that tries to minimize an error at the, at the outputs. And yeah, so it's basically trying to minimize an error. And then we change the weights accordingly in order to make this uh, neural network approximate the function given by our data. And here I display two of the most important separation of neural networks. One of them is recurrent neural networks, and the other one is fully connected neural networks. Recurrent neural networks have a hidden state. That means that the neural network itself de is dependent on the history of the previous inputs. So one could uh, think that recurrent neural networks might be better or more suitable when uh, inputs are given sequentially. So for example, time series, it's uh, one sort of uh, area in which recurrent neural networks are used to, but also language. So for example, language is uh, it's also, we construct a sentence and we, it's sent, a sentence has a sequential meaning to it. And yeah, and the work here is, well, convolutional neural networks, not necessarily uh, feed forward or fully connected neural networks. So I will explain a little bit about convolutional neural networks as well. Convolutional neural networks are basically feed forward neural networks with two imposed constraints. And basically, they substitute the matrix multiplication that was happening here for a convolution operation. And I will uh, give in detail some explanation about the convolution operation. But here, um, we, in the convolution operation, we have a kernel. And this kernel gets cobalt in our image. So here we have a picture of our Hochschule. And we will make a, a convolution. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the operation, but it's a, you just put this matrix over here and you multiply all the elements and you sum them up. And this gives you one pixel over here. And then you keep moving forward this sort of operator and you'll get these sort of uh, pixel values that each time this operator is applied one pixel here. And at the end, from this handcrafted kernel, I'll get some edge detection. And this edge detection uh, will help us eventually, or could help us eventually to create a system that is able to recognize something, right? But the idea of a convolutional neural network is to know or to learn the elements of the kernel. So in order to, when it convolves the image, you get features that are important or that are more suitable for the classification. And as I mentioned before, these are the two constraints that are given to a neural network or to a fully connected neural network in order to convert it into a convolutional neural network. One of them is local connectivity, which tells you that not all the input values are going to be as important for the neural network, or that you're only looking at the local patch of the input values in order to make a explicit computation. So, uh, or in more, um, in our words, a pixel that is located on the far end of the image might not be as important for a local patch that is located on the other end. And weight churn, weight churn tells you that a set of pixels or a set of uh, extracted feature from a, from a local patch of pixels will be important for the other patches. And therefore, you will assign the same weights to all the patches. And at the end, you impose these two constraints. And yeah, magically, your feedforward neural network is converted into a convolutional neural network. And this is uh, one of the images that I like very much because it explicitly tells you how to calculate the 
or how the convolutional uh, neural network works. But in this case, let's think about a, an RGB image. An RGB image is a matrix that consists of, or three matrices are stuck together. And we would have a kernel, which is represented by this other tiny matrix, which is also a, a, a volume of, uh, of three stack matrices. And what we do basically is just uh, cobol the kernel with the input. So we do this by, for example, looking at this specific uh, x, y in the input uh, feature map. We will multiply each value, this 0 times this 0, and this 1 times this minus 1. And we will do this with the first slice of the kernel. And then the second slice of the feature map, we will do it with the second slice of the kernel, and so forth for the other ones. And then, once we have uh, computed all these uh, multiplications, all of these will get sum. And then finally, all these three values that uh, came into scalars will get some. And then finally, a bias will also get some. <laughs> these summing values at the end are uh, very magically given. And also, this is something that uh, was improved later on, which I'll later talk about as well. But yeah, this is the way in which a convolution uh, neural network looks like, in the, in the convolution layer at least. So it's, it's just you're learning these sort of 3D kernel weights that are cobalt in, a, in an ordered volume of of an image, for example. And another interesting thing is that we have, for example, here two kernels, kernel one and kernel two. And kernel one gives us another feature map, and kernel two will give us another feature map. And a feature map is just a modification of the original image by cobalting the kernel. So if we have, uh, for example, M or N feature map, sorry, we will have N, or sorry, if we have N kernels, we will have N feature maps at the end. So we can control the amount of feature maps you want by the amount of kernels that you have. And this is one of the most successful uh, convolutional neural networks, which is BGG16. BGG16, I believe, won in 2014 the ImageNet competition. ImageNet competition is a competition of classifying 1,000 uh, classes from 1.3 million images. And this is... Um, this is a very incredible result. Uh, it's, I like to think of it as a, a, some sort of system that you can integrate into, for example, into your robot platform, and it's able to identify 1,000 classes. So now we could put this into a robot, and the robot will walk around, and it can take a picture of something, and it will say, yeah, this is, a, this is a computer, yeah, this is a person, and it will do this for 1,000 classes. And now we can do this, and this is very easy to do. But... Yeah, these sort of convolutional neural networks are computationally very expensive. For example, they have around 138 million weights. But another interesting thing is that, as I explained before, we have these convolutional uh, layers. And at the end, you add a fully connected layer, which is a very traditional approach to construct a neural network. So you have this convolution, 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 and then you have the fully connected layers. And these fully connected layers account for the 90% of all parameters in the network. So this is also very, very interesting. Like it, it might not be completely convolutional, but it's 90% some fully connected network, right? So, yeah. So another solution to in order to reduce the amount of parameters that we have in our fully connected part is to create uh, or to add a global average pooling layer. And a global average pooling layer will take the feature maps and it will just make them, sorry, it will take these feature maps and it will convert them into a single scalar value. So in the previous approach, what was happening is that we have the feature maps and each feature map gets flattened and then concatenated with all the other ones. And then from here, we will perform a fully connected layer and then it will, it will turn out to be the output values. But in this case, what we are actually gonna perform is we're gonna take this feature map and we wanna do a global, um, it will, we'll do perform an average of all the elements in the feature map, and then this average will turn itself into a scalar value. And then these scalar values will actually be the output nodes. So why are we performing the average? This is a good, uh, yeah, this is something that is rather interesting because average gives you information, you need information of all the single nodes in your convolutional neural network in order to, to have a, uh, in order to have something significant. But if you have something like the maximum value of it, then you're kind of losing information about it. So global, uh, or the, the mentality of why using um, average is just to give individual um, representation to all the nodes in the feature map. 
And yes, our initial architecture, which is uh, the one that I uh, propose in this work, it consists of nine convolution layers, which use global average pooling at the last layer, and it has around 16, um, 600,000 parameters. And it achieves an accuracy of 96 in the IMDB dataset, and 66 on the FER 2013 dataset. This uh, model is 7.5 megabytes, so it's uh, rather small. And yeah, other methods achieve the same accuracy, but using uh, an ensemble of convolutional neural networks. So this also might prove low, slow for um, real-time systems. But this is not the end of the story here, because at the end, 600,000 parameters seems rather cumbersome for, for a simple task. So we decided to explore more on modern architectures on convolutional neural networks, and we encountered this exception architecture, which combines two of the most successful experimental assumptions in convolutional neural networks, that is the use of residual models and depth-wise separable convolutions. And this, uh, the use of these two um, sort of uh, models or um, assumptions are basically the state of the art right now in convolutional neural networks, which is, yeah, the residual models that instead of actually performing a sequential operation on the future maps, we will divide the future map so it adds an identity to it. And we will perform a convolution, a convolution again by a nonlinear function, and then we add the previous future map. So this is something like um, a perturbation method in, in which you have the future map and you want to see which perturbations in the future map actually make, make it better in order for the classification to, to be more accurate. But the most important thing about the residual models is that it makes the backpropagation algorithm which changes the, which is optimization algorithm, or which is the algorithm that modifies the weight sufficiently, makes it easy to create a bridge between the previous feature map. So it's able to propagate the, the, the gradient easily through the network, which is, this is also a well-known problem in convolutional neural networks, that the, the, the convolutions get so, or the neural network gets so big that the actual backpropagation of the gradient also gets decreasing or also explodes depending on, the, on certain assumptions. But this allows you to backpropagate the, the gradient easily and therefore this architecture won, I believe, the 2015 ImageNet, which consisted of 101 uh, layers of convolutions, one after each other. And the other one, uh, which is depth-wise separable convolutions. And as I explained before, you have these sort of kernels, right? These 3D volumes that map the, the input images with, um, that try to convert it to another set of feature maps. And in this case, the depth-wise separable convolutions try to separate the cross-correlations between the spatial values and the channel values. So instead of having 3D volume kernels that will be cobalt in the input feature map, we will make them channel dependent. So in this case, we have a channel that has its own kernel. So all the, all the input feature maps will have a specific kernel, which is, um, yeah, in this case, dk, dk times one. And we will learn to, we will learn to um, mix the values outputted by the, by the, by the filters in several ways, which are given by this one time one convolution. So the one, once time one convolution, what is doing, it's mixing the values given by these sort of uh, kernels here. And yeah, this sort of reduction gives you a factor of one over n plus one over d square. And this also eliminated some parameters in our convolution neural network. And at the end, our final architecture, which is based on this exception network, was able to, yeah, we reduce the parameters so 10 times more, so we have six, uh, 60,000 parameters now, and the model is around 853 kilobytes. It achieves almost the same accuracy in the gender classification. In the previous model, if you recall, it's 96, here's 95. And also, emotion classification was exactly the same, which is 66. 
And our complete pipeline that included the phase detection and the gender classification, emotional classification takes around, yeah, I mean, this much <laughs> of seconds, 0.48 seconds, right? And this on a low end GPU, and yeah, on a, on a i5 uh, CPU was around 0.051 seconds. So I mean, it's a, um, so basically we reduce the amount of parameters that we actually need in a, in a convolutional neural network in order to perform a system, a real-time system. And these are, I'll, I'll show this later, but these are some of our results. So this is what we want, right? We have, uh, this is our Robocop team in um, Italy, and we're performing a competition. So here we have blue represents women, and the other ones represent men. And he, yeah, happy men. I mean, this is very fairly easy to, to represent, right? Happy, 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 happy. And this is neutral, if you cannot read it. And yes, yeah, so we have also something here, which is sad men. And, but if you, yeah, I don't know, it's, uh, this is, uh, this error here was made for the, because of the phase detection algorithm, which is the OpenCV implementation. But uh, yeah, if you kind of look at it, uh, more closely, you can see there is some sort of eyebrows there, and uh, yeah, uh, the mat looks at you know. And this is another um, yeah fun thing that I uh, work on, which is uh, yeah this is the Solvay conference, and here is Marie Curie, and then Albert Einstein, and yeah the other famous physicists, and it says angry woman, which I believe is correct, <laughs> and uh, yeah neutral man. This uh, movie that I liked, which is called Twelve Angry Men, and. Uh, <laughs> And then you can see that not all of them are angry. I think none of them are angry. Neutral, sad, neutral. And yeah, I'll show you some of the results on, um, that I have in our GitHub repo. So yeah, by the way, this is um, this repository that was, um, yeah, that I did in order to uh, put my project and everything. and. Yeah, this is um, this is rather interesting because I publish it without any um, without any idea of like how um, interesting for people could be, but it turned out to be that uh, a lot of people like it, and uh, yeah, it got I, I got a nice reception. Uh, yeah, I got a lot nice contributions from the open software community, and here are the same examples. Well, here's different uh, faces for the emotions, and here's a real sense of me. And I'll explain later why this is so, why this might be interesting. Because like, okay, this is sad. I might not look so sad, right? But this angry. I'm not angry here. This, this is kind of weird, right? But I'll, t I'll talk about my errors later on, which is also very interesting. And yes, perfect. Mm. And yeah, and well, let me just go back here which is uh, the visualization technique that I was talking to you about. This visualization technique is called guided backpropagation, and basically what it's doing, you give it as input the image, and then you wobble the pic, the, or you can think of it as wobbling the elements of the picture and seeing which neuron gets activated in the neural network. And you look at the, at the neuron that gets activated the most, and then you keep wobbling the, the, the pixels, and you find the, the pixels that correlate more with the, with the activation of a neuron inside your convolutional neural network. And therefore, it could tell you which pixels in the image make a neuron activate the most. And here, for example, uh, I believe every, every row is uh, an emotion. So apparently, this guy was angry. Uh, because, yeah, I know Samuel L. Jackson was angry here. And so we can, for example, see that the neural network responds very uh, uh, heavily on the smile, obviously. So this is something that, uh, I mean, we expected it from the neural network. We also see something interesting here, which is that the surprise uh, classification depends solely on the eyes, or mostly on the eyes. So how big your eye, eyeballs are open. So this is also very interesting. And also, yeah, angry, which is the, one, the part that I wanted to talk about. Like, angry seems that you, you, you only have to, like, really, um, I don't know how this, uh, you only have to make your face like this, and it will, the neural network, you will trick the neural network to believe that you're actually angry. So you just have to do this. Not really, you don't have to be extremely angry. You just have to really perform this sort of face. And this is why I was telling you in the real, in the real life model that I didn't look angry. But 
yeah, this is why you have also to be careful around these open source <laughs> implementations, right? Because I know what activates the neural network the most, so I can make the faces that activate it, right? So you also have to think about it. <laughs> and um, yes, another interesting um, idea or uh, problem that arose is that, mo as, sorry, as most of, uh, as I mentioned before, yeah, this data set, right? I mean, this data set, it's uh, rather, it's very oriented to Western looking faces, right? So I was, um, yeah, I'm, I was here in the Hochschule and the Robocop uh, competition, what's happening in Japan. And I received a lot of emails from people in Japan telling me that my uh, implementation didn't work because it was not working for Asian people. I mean, it, it was not working because obviously the data set is of these people, right? And um, also something very interesting that I uh, encountered was the use of glasses. The neural network confused people that got angry with, uh, with a person that was only wearing a glass or wearing glasses like mine, for example, which are uh, very dark. But also more, most interesting, I think, is that the neural network got conf I, ha I, had a, I had a friend of mine and she was sitting in front of it and we had the live demo on it. And she, had, she didn't have any glasses and it was classifying her as a woman. She put her glasses on, it said men. So this is something also very interesting that I would like to pinpoint from the data sets. I mean, the, you really have to dig into the data set to look what errors, my, what errors might occur inside the network, right? It might be biased to say that because a person is wearing glasses, it might be a man. Why? Because all the samples that you give to a neural network of persons wearing glasses are men, right? And yeah, yeah so future work. The reduction of parameters uh, made us create a real-time system, but this is not the end of how uh, much we can reduce the amount of parameters. We also can perform some evolutionary strategies, strategies in order to reduce the parameters, depending on maybe the amount of kernels that we have. This was also not a parameter that I, uh, that I tweaked too much, so I believe further optimization can be developed here. Also, we can incorporate more classifications. I mean, the networks that we're turning are so small that we can create more of them in order to produce, for example, H. And this also H data, it's in the IMDB data set. So we can easily train another neural network for this. And then the last one, which is create double-headed models, which means that from a single forward pass, you can output several classes, at several, yeah, several classes that include for example, happy, or that include emotions, that include gender, and that include age. But in order to produce this successfully, we will have to have data set that contains the three labels, so that at every time we forward pass the image, we have the information of the three labels. So this is also uh, something that we do not have, and this is something that, uh, therefore, I, I couldn't able to, to make it. But at least for the age and for the gender, that are contained in the same data set, we can create these sort of double-headed uh, neural networks. And yes, uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I will, um, how much time do we have? Is it, uh, we have time? Yeah, okay, this is the first, uh, this is a sort of half of the presentation that I was uh, trying to give today. And if we have time after the questions, I would like to give another talk if you guys are interested, which is again, convolutional neural networks and not pers uh, yeah, and open software um, relation to it, which is for image captioning. But yeah, thank you. Any questions? So uh, recently I read an article about uh, recognizing street signs uh, just with the same sort of neural network. Yeah. It shows that, okay, we have a stop sign and put some sprays, some extra text on it. But, uh, the computer would think it's a turning sign and not a stop, uh, stopping sign. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a human, you know, if it's an octagon and it's red, it's a stop sign with letter text is on it. Yeah. It can be an error or whatever, you know, it's a stop sign. Yeah. Um, how can one ensure that when one is training such a thing, that really the most important uh, things are used for discrimination and mm -hmm. not uh, mm -hmm. something that might work for the image set, but may not work for the real uh, life. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yeah, this is a very interesting question, which is uh, how can we make uh, sure that our networks are able to generalize correctly and that the small perturbances in the input data don't change the output? And this is a very hot topic right now. And I believe maybe the paper that you read was on adversarial networks, which they tried to create uh, different modifications. So I think they, there's even some examples in which they add noise, which for us, it's, uh, we cannot see this noise, one, it's an image. And then the class changes entirely from what it was assigned, for example, into a panda. And, but the, the noise is, is not, it's, it, we are not able to perceive it. And this, yeah, this is a well-known problem. But another thing is that it's, it's well-known for convolution neural networks, but it's also well-known for most of the machine learning uh, algorithms. So it's not only for convolution neural networks. So one can also optimize noise that you give to input data to an SVM or to something else that will change the output. So I mean, this is, this is a big problem in machine learning in general, and not necessarily only in convolutional neural networks. Yes. So I, I believe what people, I mean, currently there's, as I mentioned, this is a very hot topic, and currently there is even a competition in Kaggle in which they're trying to create adversarial examples, so in order to make the neural networks more robust. So to, there's no answer as far as I know right now. No. Also, you don't generally plug your neural network directly into the driving system, so you run several of them optimized differently in parallel, and then uh, random forest uh, classifier on top of it all. So that you have your octagon, something that's just doing octagons uh, recognition, and something that's just doing red, and then something on top of it, and all three in parallel plus the random forest uh, gives you a usable result. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was the mechanism to train the neural network? Have you picked different kernels and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. compare them to the success rate? Do they give the information of age or maybe email information? And you've picked the most successful set of kernels mm -hmm. to yeah. or what was the, yeah. the input set is here yeah, for mm -hmm. magic images. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the training process or yeah. the evaluation um, yeah okay so the question is how is uh, how is the training and evaluation process performed um, well the, the training process is uh, I believe well known in um, neural networks which is just the implementation of the back propagation algorithm, which that's, uh, that's why it's so important because I don't have to choose the elements in the kernel. The kernels uh, or the neural network learn to choose uh, the values for me. And, and the evaluation procedure, well, we basically divided our data set into um, yeah, training, validation, and test, and then we just perform, um, we use the model that performed better on the validation, and then we just proceeded to test it. Yeah. So the yeah the complete uh, yeah chosen of the of the values in the kernel is not my uh, I didn't do it <laughs> the the optimizer did it for me. <laughs> okay, so, so what you measure mm -hmm. is uh, basically end to end uh, the data set and what mm -hmm. the network is. Exactly. Yeah. But, but how do you divide between mm -hmm. uh, just train following input that's basically overtrained? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and 
Yeah. Just, is it just the compairment to the IMDb database image uh, mm -hmm. success? Yeah, or mm -hmm. yeah you, will to, you have to perform the, um, this is why you have the validation set, because you want to see that your validation set is always, uh, is performing correctly, right? So you split something that you're not um, training on, and in order to see that it's performing well, and in order that it's able to generalize well, and yes, this validation set comes only from the original data set. Yes. Yeah. In order for back propagation to work, yeah. you need to define the error function. Yes, exactly. Because there's multiple things which you need to account for. Did you test for um, the matching choice for face detection? Did you test for matching where the face is in the image? And then how did you get a distance? Yes, uh, the, the loss function is nothing fancy here. <laughs> it's something, um, the, you have several loss functions, as you mentioned, you have this uh, square loss, for example. But here, we only use uh, the typical classification loss entropy loss, which is just tell you the, the entropy of how well, or the cross entropy, basically. So it tells you how well your um, output values in this, looking at them, if they were a probability distribution, how well it compares to the probability distribution of the of the actual thing. Yeah. So the cross entropy loss, yeah. So it's nothing really special. And right now the, the research in uh, analyzing the visuals of those images. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so the question is whether or not we can incorporate um, video analysis in our robots. And uh, yeah, obviously this is something very interesting as well, but this is also something that becomes computationally uh, complicated, right? Because you have to account for now video would have another, would add another dimension to your neural network. And, uh, but yeah, there's current research on this for, for example, um, how you call this, to, to detect whether a, what a person is in action uh, classification, yes, action classification. Yeah. Further questions before I proceed to the next, uh, yes? You mentioned uh, the reduction, so you mentioned that the public naked layer has accounts for 90% of all network weights, mm -hmm. but uh, can you name the numbers of the reduction, so how much weight you manage to cut in your examples when you put the flattering in one by one convolutions and everything, so how mm -hmm. much did you win computation? Yeah, this, uh, the question is how much did I win from cutting out the, the last fully connected uh, uh, values? Well, I, have, I would have had to train a fully connected network in order to see how many values are actually, um, how many values actually give me the same uh, classification accuracy. So I didn't do this. <laughs> I proceeded. Uh, I proceeded explicitly to perform the global average pooling, which I knew it was something uh, that already gave you a reduction. Yeah. But as we saw, for example, that the incorporation of the uh, of the exception architecture it gave us a uh, yeah it reduced uh, ten times more, right? Yes. For example, you want to implement some neural network and it's really hard to train on the new hardware. Mm -hmm. So one of the solutions is to take, for example, an Alex net, get rid of the fully connected layer, freeze all the convolutions and everything, and just train this last fully connected layer to, let's say, detect only cats. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't see this fact uh -huh. about 90%. So is it yep. uh, hope to use this sort of approach to train something easily mm -hmm. in home conditions on your GPU? Uh, does it have you ever tried something like that? Is it yeah, so the question is, have I tried doing fine-tuning? Yeah, fine-tuning. Oh, yes, that's the word. <laughs> yes, I've tried doing fine-tuning, but as you mentioned, as, as, as you saw in the BEG16 network, um, as you saw in the network, the, the network consists of three fully connected layers. So you don't take out the three, you just take only one. And then from on top of this one, you train. 
Yeah. So you don't get rid of these 90 percent, right? You, yeah. yeah, you still have some. Cool. Yes. Yes, the slides will be available. Sorry for that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there, there is information of my of everything here on the on my GitHub repository. So all the information you can find it there. But I'll make sure that also people from Frost can uh, have it. Okay. Good. Then I'll proceed to the. I mean, if we have some time, I guess uh, we have 20 minutes. I'll proceed with something. Um, that might be also interesting for people that it's um so yeah yes so What I'm going to present now is image caption and classification of anomalous situation. This project was also made with Professor Paul Pluger. And it's, um, it's also trained a convolution and an LSTM network in order to account for situations in which, the situa in, in which values might be uh, dangerous. Or for, ex for example, we would like to train a neural network that tells us that. Uh, that creates a description of the situation, and this description will give us information on whether or not the situation should be important for the robot. So image captioning consists of a convolutional neural network and a LSTM network that in conjunction perform or construct a sentence of the image. So the neural network will take the image and it will perform, a, it will say, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. And this is image captioning. And our basic um, example or basic uh, thing that we would like to perform is a system in which a robot sees a situation, it takes a picture of the situation, and then it describes the situation, or it makes a sentence of the situation. This sort of sentence can be communicated to someone else, and then they could proceed in order to, as they see fit regarding whatever is happening. So for example, in this case, the robot will approach. And instead of having several components in a robot in which they try to do maybe post estimation, in which they try to do um, several classifications, we will have a single component that will tell us everything that we would like to know about the situation at hand. So in this case, the robot will, be, will approach. It will take a picture, and then it will say, an elderly man is laying unconscious on the ground. And this is the system that we created. And yeah, LSTMs are uh, another form of recurrent neural network that are a little bit more complicated. But uh, yeah, they are differential versions of the memory chip in a digital computer. This is what Alex Reib said, and which is a famous researcher that uh, worked with LSTMs uh, for a long time. And basically, LSTMs contain several gates that control the input, the output, and the hidden state of the network. And I will not go into too much detail about this, but um, Yes, the process in which the image captioning system works is just passes an image through a pre-trained convolutional neural network, as I explained before. It processes into the first state of the recurrent neural network. And then the recurrent neural network will start predicting, giving the information of the image, a word or the first word in the, in the, in the sentence. Then it will use the next value in which it was trained on and the hidden state in order to produce the next word in the sentence. And it will continue to carry on until it performs a sentence such as this. A group of young people playing a game of street speed is explicitly or given here, in which you have a stored token, you have the information of the image, and then it produces a straw. And then given the word straw, and the hidden information of the previous step, it will produce hat. And then if you give hat, and the given information from the previous two steps, it will give you the token end. So we'd learn to create a sentence. And this, there was a problem regarding our data contained in the, for this case, because there are usually not data sets that contain anomalous situations. So we don't have data sets that contain, for example, guns or people maybe in pain or, or blood. So we had to actually go into Flickr 
look for these images and then ask people uh, around our uh, uh, university to label or to create a sentence for each of these images. So this was a, a very enduring process, but at the end we collected 8,000, or sorry, 100, 1,008 captioned images and that were um, captioned by 20 different people here. And yeah, all of our images are under Creative Commons license and I hope to make them available soon so people can work on this also in machine learning. And these are some of the examples that I recollected in our data, which include, for example, a person that has been injured, a, uh, a police officer holding a gun, and some violent images and some things running on, um, being on fire in, on the street. And we implemented one of these uh, image captioning models and we obtain a, a score of 14.2, a meteor score, which tells you, which tries to compare sentences, basically how much a sentence um, is in accordance to another reference sentence. So this uh, sort of evaluation is also very mysterious because it's, uh, it's built by humans in which some parameters are also well-tuned and I believe this metric should improve. But anyhow, this is the sort of metric that people use in these uh, captioning models. And we also obtain an accuracy of 97%, which means that I'll give you an image, and then I will tell you, I, will, I want to know whether the image is an anomaly or not an anomaly. So it, we receive an accuracy of 97% for this. And these are some of our results that we obtained. So this is uh, the image that we received, and the neural network said this. A man is doing a trick on a skateboard. Then we gave an image of this, a train traveling down these tracks next to a lush room field. A group of people flying kites in a field, pizza with cheese and herbs on the table. Yeah, this with a laptop and a monitor. Just, yeah, this is also, I think, very difficult and could also be for very, a good application for robots. And then a man on a server riding a wave in the ocean. And these are some of the errors that we also got from these non-anomalies images which are a woman sitting on a bed with a laptop computer. Well, it's not a laptop computer, but it's a, a, some sort of cushion. And then a dirty toilet in a small room with a wooden floor. There's, <laughs> it's rather dirty, but uh, yeah, there's no wooden floor or anything like uh, But there's wood here, so I don't know like, what's happening actually here, right? So it's uh, also very, we, we, we would have to make some sort of error evaluation of the network to actually see what's happening there. A cat sitting on a car seat with a concerned look. <laughs> and this word here, concern, or concerned look, it's also very like, uh, why did it happen, right? Well, I, I went into the data and I found out that a lot of people describe images that are looking towards them as concerned. So this is why we have the word concerned here, because it's also biased in the data, right? And then, we discovered that our neural network doesn't know how to count. So a cup of coffee and a cup of coffee. So this, <laughs> um, this might not be entirely wrong, but still it's, uh, yeah. And yeah, a man is eating a sandwich and drinking beer. A man and a woman holding wine glasses. So this is also wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and these are some of the examples that were, uh, that were, that we captured, that our neural network captioned and that I, I believe that they are positive. So a man is holding a gun. So it only took the image and was able to create, a, <coughs> learn the English language and then create a sentence out of it. And then here, a house is burning. A car is crashing a snow-covered street. There is a woman with blood on the floor. A man is choking another man. A firefighter is trying to put out a fire. So, I mean, this is what we wanted. We wanted a system that we can incorporate in a robot that is able to tell us whether some information um, might be an anomaly, right? And these are some of the results in which, uh, yeah, in which the neural network didn't perform as well for anomalies. Um, people with red helmets are sitting on a cars on A. So we see that the neural network doesn't always finish the sentences. There is a broken window lane on the ground. So there's no, there's, I believe that this might be because there's some variation here on the floor, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. And a man is showing his injured shoulder. So it's, uh, it's not showing his shoulder. <laughs> and then a man is showing his right arm in which he has a severe injury. 
mean, this is not his right arm. This is his leg, but it's difficult, right? A man is a man is being held by the police. <laughs> so I mean, it's not a police, but uh, referees. So I mean, this, <laughs> a man is dancing with a woman on a dance floor. I don't know what's happening there, to be honest. So this is also a difficult caption, right? Like, wh what are we asking to the network? What are we training it for? I mean, this is also complicated, right? So we have to look at the images we're given. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. This is another small project we had. Questions? Questions? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, the question is where I use, um, whether I write, whether I wrote everything from scratch or whether I use uh, a framework already. Yeah, uh, no, I use TensorFlow with Keras. Yeah, which is the, the easiest way. <laughs> Uh, any other question? Yeah? Yeah, it is rather small, just. Yes, no, uh, we perform, yeah, we divided the data set accordingly, like 2020, like 80% for uh, training and then and then from this 80 another 20 for validation, and then we did the appropriate uh, values so we don't overfit, in, at least in the classification. But the captioning part is rather complicated to evaluate, and this is why I was making a small remark on the, on the metrics used on the um, captioning scenario. It's, uh, it's also very hard-coded, <laughs> so I, I don't trust it too much. Yes. Any other question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.